Good afternoon, Saints. We've had a wild week in Bonifé. But uh, we're about to get settled in. We appreciate all your prayers. Um, we're, the move went smoothly for the most part. And uh, except leaving a couple things, we had to come back and bring some stuff and get some other stuff and having a flat tire at 10 o'clock at night. But we had to fix a flat. And uh, so we got home safely. And that was to make a long story short. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8. And uh, there will be another, at least one more, maybe two, out of this chapter. I think this chapter is that important. Especially in this day and time. Because if we don't see this as God sees it, we can be a defeated people very quickly in times like today. Verse 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. How different is that from what Brock preached on last Sunday in Jeremiah? He was going to remember their iniquities, and he was not going to give them mercy. And yet he's saying, to us, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, a new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and groweth old is ready to vanish away. Our Abba Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the living word Jesus who came and made a reality of the Old Covenant and Old Testament and is making a reality of the New Covenant and the New Testament. We pray as we look in your word that we would be fed, that grace would abound in our life, that we would look upon Jesus every day and see him fresh and his mercies as fresh. As we look into your word, may we hear the soft sound of sandaled feet. May we see Jesus in him only. We pray these things in his name and the power of the Spirit. Amen. And perhaps you're wondering what this is. I stole this out of a magazine called Present Truth Magazine about in the mid-1970s. The magazine's out of print, but you can go online and you can read it. Trying to get it Okay. And so I copied that and I made a picture of it. And you're going to you, you see some things there, but I'm going to explain what is there. This is about the first coming and the second coming. In the first coming, which is also called the first advent, Jesus came with a mission or a purpose which was to fulfill what his Father had given him to do. And his first coming, he visited and redeemed his people. We see in Luke 168 that he redeemed his people. We're going to go over these verses in a minute. Matthew 121, we see he saved his people from their sins. He brought in everlasting righteousness in Daniel 9.24. And by one offering, He perfected forever them that are being sanctified in Hebrews 10.14. He put away sin, Hebrews 9.26. He abolished death and brought life and immortality to life in 2 Timothy 1.10. Thus, through His redemptive act in Christ, God has given His people redemption, salvation, righteousness, and perfection. And what does Hebrew says? Let us go on to perfection. It's in Christ. It's not in us. In Christ, He has already done away with sin, abolished death, and given to His people the gift of life and immortality. 
All this is plainly stated by the Apostles' proclamation of the Gospel. In the second advent, what do the Apostles tell us about it? The very same thing. It is called the Day of Redemption in the second advent. Did we have redemption in the first? We have redemption in the second. We see also in eight, Romans 8.23, Christ will appear a second time to bring salvation to those who are watching for Him. Hebrews 9.28, Here Paul and all who love His appearing will receive their crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4.8 and Galatians 5.5. 5. Here believers of past ages, together with those of the present age, will be made perfect together. Hebrews 11.40, Philippians 3.10 and 12. When Christ comes, God's people will put off the sinful, mortal state, the last enemy, death, and be swallowed up in victory, and God's people will put on immortality. All this will take place when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Colossians 3.4 So the very things that Christ did for us at His first coming are said to be brought to completion at His second coming. So I would admonish you to look in... Uh, 1 Corinthians 5.17 You already know this is one of my favorite verses. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. In Christ, we are already in the new creation. Because according to this, what He did at the first coming is true of the second coming. And we're in the now, but not yet. The now, but not yet. Whatever we got now, we will get fully because we have the down payment now. And he says, the new creation has come. The old has gone. Behold, the new is here. Luke, recording Zechariah, John's father, in the first chapter of Luke, verse 68, I'll begin with verse 67. His father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He has visited and redeemed His people. So that's the first one, redemption. Then in Matthew, Joseph is having a problem. He finds out Mary is pregnant. He gets a visit by an angel. And the angel said, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. What if your girlfriend told you that? Would you believe it? But see, when the girlfriend says it, she's not an angel, is she? But God sent an angel to Joseph. And uh, he goes on to say, She shall bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Then we see that's redemption and salvation. Next, everlasting righteousness. In Daniel 9th chapter, verse 24, 70 weeks or 70 sevens are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. I'm going to skip a couple of verses here and go in. It says, after three score and two weeks, that's 483 years, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood, and upon the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he goes back to and sort of repeats what he said. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the middle of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. How did he do that? By being the sacrifice himself. And he put an end to sin by establishing everlasting righteousness. Then in Hebrews 10.14 
But a certain fearful looking, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. For, for by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are being sanctified. Whoever invented these was a genius. <laughs> if he could just point me to the right verse, right? So we see salvation, redemption, everlasting righteousness, perfection. Let us go unto perfection. And who, is, who does the perfecting? By one offering he's perfected forever them that are sanctified. It's not something we do. When somebody tells you this and this and this and they give you the idea that you have to be the sinless perfection one, they're lying to you. The Bible says by one offering he has made us perfect forever. And then Hebrews 9.26 Now, once in the end of the ages hath He appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. He put away sin and perfected us. Hebrews 10.14 and 9.26 are saying the same thing and yet in a different way. One, He's perfected us. And the other one, He took away our sin. And then He brought in life and immortality and abolished death. We see this in 2 Timothy 1.10 verse 9 But according to His own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. When was this grace given to us? It was planned before the world began. But is now made manifest. Now it becomes known to us, applied to us through the cross. By the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death, brought life and immortality to light through the Gospel. The Gospel life brings us immortality and abolishes death. And He did this all in Christ for us. That's the first coming. In the second coming, we see in Ephesians... 4.30 Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God by whom ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. See? Redemption, redemption. This is also stated by Paul in Romans 8.23 Not only they, but ourselves also who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We have the first fruits. Who is that? The Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves waiting for the adoption. I thought we were already adopted. We are. But we're going to be fully adopted. Physically. That is the redemption of our body at the resurrection when this body that we have with its aches and pains becomes immortal and glorified. We see salvation. In Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. Okay. But now, I'll, I'll repeat 26. Once in the end of the ages hath appeared, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this is judgment. So Christ was offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that eagerly look for Him shall He appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Does the fact that Christ coming again, does that make you want to see Him? Or do you want to run the other way? I know a lot of people want to run the other way. But if you are a saint, you should be eagerly waiting for your redemption, your salvation to come. Then we see everlasting righteousness. In 2 Timothy 4 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. And this is Paul talking, but then he says this not only for me, but unto all them that love his appearing. All those that love his appearing have this crown of righteousness coming on that day. 
And we see in Galatians 5.5, 5, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness of faith. Through the Spirit we wait for this hope of righteousness. So we have redemption, salvation, everlasting righteousness, and again perfection in Hebrews 11.40. You, you know chapter 11 is what they call the hall of faith of the Old Testament saints. These all, having received witness through faith, received not the promise. They received the witness, but they didn't get the promise. What was the promise? Christ was the promise. God having provided something better for us that they without us should not be made perfect. So on that day, the Old Testament and the New Testament saints are going to be glorified together because of Christ. So we have perfection. We saw in Hebrews 9.26 in the first coming, He put away sin. And then life and immortality to abolish death. Well, we're going to sort of combine these because of the passages I have. The first one is 1 Corinthians 15. Let's see. Oh, I left out a passage. i got to read this. On, under the perfection. It's in uh, Philippians 3. Verse 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death and attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained. See, we want to attain the resurrection now, but it's not yet. It's not as I have already attained Either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. So when He comes again, He's going to complete His perfection. Now we'll go to 1 Corinthians 15. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on corruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. We're not under the law anymore. There is no strength of sin. Sin was stirred up by the giving of the law. What was not what was already sin became transgression. We see that see that in Romans five if you want to go check it out. Twelve through nineteen. Twelve through twenty one. Be more correct. And then we see in Colossians third chapter when Christ who is our life shall appear and shall ye also appear with him in glory. Is Christ your life or is He your part of your life? That's important. Is He a segment, a department of your life? Or is He all your life? I would admonish you that He have all of your life, not just a Sunday presence. And this will be completed in glorification. Now there are a lot of people that don't believe this. And there was a verse I didn't read last week and I told you I was going to read it this week. And I am. Because Paul has something to say about people that says, where's the promise of His coming? In the book of Acts 13, it says, Behold ye despisers, 
and wonder and perish. He says, Behold, you're going to wonder. You've heard that saying that some people cause things to happen and other people wonder what happened. Christ causes things to happen. Other people are looking out and they can't see it. But he says, Behold, you're going to wonder and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you shall in no way believe, though a man declare it unto you. You know, you preach the gospel with some people to you, you're blue in the face and they will never believe. Well, Paul says, those people are going to wonder what happened. I would like to point you to who Christ is. What then about this old, I mean this first coming and this second coming? Jesus said, I have been charged with my people's sins. You know what that means? If you, you, how many of you have a, car, a debit card, credit card, or whatever? You can go and make a charge on it, right? And you get sent a bill, right? Well, guess what? Our bills are sent to Christ. He's saying, I have been charged with my people's sins. There's a Flavel, John Flavel story that uh, Jesus says, I want, want to, he says, I don't want any after reckoning, so you make sure you send them all to me. Let me pay all the bills. That means your past, present, and future bills. He says, trust me. I'm sorry, treat me as you would treat them for their sins. Whatever sins you have, saint, Christ has been treated as if He had committed those sins. Not that He committed them, but as if He had committed them. He says, whatever they owe you, Father, I will pay. And He did 2,000 years ago, hanging on a cross. And He says, I, Jesus, have written it with my own blood. That's how serious our sin is. He wrote the payment for our sins in His own blood. What we deserved, He took. He represented His people in His life, death, and resurrection. Not just the death, but the life, death, and resurrection is ours because we are united to Him. You know, out of all the people I know, I'm the worst sinner. I know. And if you know Christ, and you know yourself, you know the same about yourself. But I trust the promises of God in Christ for me. Do you? Do you trust those promises? They're just as good to you as they are to me. Isaiah said, look to Christ, all the ends of the earth, and be saved, for He is God. Confess Him as Lord and believe that He is risen and you will be saved. Or you can die in your sins. Like I said, some people don't believe they're going to die in their sins. They don't even believe that they're sinning. Don't be like Felix. Not Felix Hunger. Felix the governor of Judea where Paul was talking to him. He says, You know what? I, th I think you need to go and come back at a more convenient time. There is not a more convenient time than today to come to Christ. God does not say, listen to this, this is very important. God does not save if we promise to get rid of our sins and follow Jesus. He doesn't. He doesn't make bargains. No, He saves when we bring our sins to Him and say, Father, I cannot overcome this. I, these shackles on me are too much to bear and I cannot break the chains. When we do that, He has mercy on us. Look to Jesus to free you from the penalty of your sin. Not only the penalty, but the power. There's a lot of people who want to be freed from the penalty of sin, but they don't want to be freed from the power of sin. I've been that man. Maybe you've been that person. You, Oh, I could get a free ticket to heaven, but I can 
still do what I want to do. No, when Jesus comes, He changes what we want to do. He doesn't coerce us against our will. Look to Jesus. He will free you from your sin. Not only that, He tells us to flee the wrath to come. Come to Jesus to save you. From who? From Himself. That's who Jesus tells us to flee. Is Himself. Because He's coming back not to deal with sin. He's already done that. He's coming back to take His people home and punish the ones that rejected Him. Now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.